All right. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming today. Um, before we dive into what's going to be an awesome panel, I just wanted to take a few minutes and um, share a couple things about biosecurity at Ginkgo. So I want to make sure we do two things. One, I'm going to give you a little bit of the footing of like why we are investing so heavily in biosecurity. And then second, I want to actually go into a little bit more detail than we have in lots of these environments about what we're doing on the ground. Like, what are we inventing? What are we building? Um, so if we get those two things done in nine minutes and 30 seconds, we will have dramatic success. So Ginkgo believes, as you've heard throughout the day and you, as you've learned about Ginkgo, we believe deeply in this like, amazing future made by biology. The, the simple reality is, for that to be true, you've got to do two things. One, people have to love and trust products. That's like in any industry. And then the second thing that needs to be true is that, and maybe, maybe very fresh from the last three years, people have to be willing to leave their homes to engage with a beautiful future invented by biology, right? And so when you think about biosecurity as a footing, that is what we're trying to make sure exists, that those two things are true. I love the analogy here of how companies like Google spent, have spent so much money over the years and, and their peers on cybersecurity. Why is that true? It's true because for Google's products to be amazing and to be loved, people have to trust the internet. The internet has to work. It has to be uh, an amazing platform. And so cybersecurity is critical for the future of, for the digital ecosystem to exist. Ginkgo, ha we, we have not lost the lesson of the internet here, and we, it's very clear to us that for this like, amazing future of biology to exist, we have to invest in biosecurity. And then the last piece of footing is to continually remember, and it, and it would be forgiven to forget this again after the last three years, that biosecurity is not actually just synonymous with health security. Biology is everything around us. It is everywhere at all times, right? So it is, it is plants being healthy. It is the climate being healthy. Biosecurity permeates lots of different parts of the world we live in. And I think for us, like, when we think about the suite of technologies over time, like over an arc of time as you build biosecurity, you've got to really imagine every place that biology interacts with the economy. Where are those, where are those uh, inflection points where biology interacts with the economy? And those are the ones that we need to be focused on securing. So with all that kind of big picture stuff, I will say that the COVID-19 pandemic did give us a chance to take philosophy and move it into very specific practical tools. And that, that started for us with the opportunity to opera, operationalize kind of at massive, massive scale a response to SARS-CoV-2. Over the last three years in kind of in detail, what, what the, core that, the core that what Ginkgo built is essentially what you can think of as like a radar system for places like schools and nursing homes. To be able to go to a school and give somebody who would never usually have these tools of data generation around biology, a principal, for example, give them the ability to monitor a classroom for COVID outbreaks. That is something that we were able to build and deploy at, at scale across the country. Uh, we ultimately worked in 37 states. Many of these programs are still going. Um, we, we collected almost 12 million samples to date um, and supported 5,500 organizations. You know, this also for kind of framing in our biosecurity business gave us a new way to think about essentially a product roadmap, like what is the architecture for what things do we need to be investing in and innovating in. And I really love this way of thinking about the definition of biosecurity in the context of how we think about it at Ginkgo. It's the application of modern tools of biotechnology at scale, think nationwide, to counter harmful biology in all its forms and origins, right? And as we move through the pandemic, the public health emergency is over. Thankfully, many of our school programs are moving on over the last year, schools returning to normal. Now, Modula, you would love to make sure you had outbreak detection if a new variant popped up that was you know, terrible for children, but thankfully things are moving on. We started to ask ourselves, where does this mindset, where are these capabilities best applied? And with, with 
a lot of thinking about a lot of places, it became pretty obvious when you think about how global travel works that we should probably be doing this in places like airports. And we were super lucky to find a partnership with CDC and Express Check, um, like super innovative parts of the organizations to say, let's try to figure out how do we take this like radar station mindset, this outbreak monitoring mindset, and monitor airports. And so what we're doing today across seven airports in partnership with CDC is running a program where when airplanes land in the US, we're both uh, taking anonymous swabs from volunteers, just like we did with K through 12 students in their classrooms, and now wastewater off of airplanes to quickly detect variants of SARS-CoV-2. We're also doing that with flu. So now it becomes multi-pathogen. This is a platform to monitor for lots of different types of infectious disease. What's cool about this program is it starts to move us to this like next layer of what people talk about as like the global immune system, right? So when you get a new variant of SARS-CoV-2, you're able to start in partnership with CDC and others thinking about, well, is this going to be immune evasive? Is this going to be worse? Or is this kind of a normal, normal thread of a variant? With the flu program, you know, the aspiration there over time is to be able to detect and immediately put something like a, uh, a border monitoring program into a vaccine manufacturing program. That would be, you know, how, you, how do you tie your detection into response? This is seven airports today. This is something that we are growing, and it feels like it's a, an amazing program, but what is most important about it to me personally, and as we talk to lots of people around the country, is that it starts to feel like a new type of infrastructure. It's a platform for biosecurity, just like you have platforms for other type of security. It starts to feel like a network that can be used for making sure that we are better coming out of this pandemic than we were going in from a capability standpoint. The United States is not the only place that has issues with biological risk, right? Biology does not respect borders. We've taken this idea of radar stations now, and for the last 18 months, have been, our teams have been going around the world doing partnerships with countries, just like those countries deployed cybersecurity technologies as digital technologies became uh, pervasive. Many of them are looking and saying, yes, I get that I need to think about innovation in my biosecurity platform. We now have active programs, um, pilots or MOUs in 10 countries that we've announced and we continue to push really hard uh, to expand those. Here's a really you know, a cool picture of some of the work that's being done on the ground. Um, you know, I would just point out these capabilities exist. We're partnering with countries to deploy systems and bring things that, that we're innovating on here in the US. So like, if you look at the um, little device that connects the airplane uh, to the airplane, that's a, a device that our team invented to make it really fast and easy to collect wastewater out of the wastewater tanks in a uh, marginally less uh, disgusting way than you could imagine otherwise. Um, I think then the third phase of this, if you go from schools and outbreak monitoring, it being the use case for radar stations, to airports, to get early warning for pathogens and then move into characterization and vaccine development, the third one is once you have that radar mindset, where else would you want to be monitoring that, have, that are areas of high biological risk? Like with cybersecurity, we monitor nodes all the time. We monitor every phone, every network, constant, persistent, pervasive monitoring to make sure that you can quickly respond to threats. So we see a world, and this is, kind of, this is very much where we're going with all of our country partners, where there's a number of areas that you'd want to drop a radar station to get very, uh, very consistent monitoring of pathogens. One of the next major areas um, are areas that are affected by conflict or natural disaster. So this, I was just in Kyiv um, two weeks ago. We're launching a partnership with the Ukrainian Public Health Center to help um, do wastewater monitoring in areas that have been affected by the conflict with Russia. It's a, it's a rebuild of public health infrastructure, but a rebuild with a, with a mindset, with the capabilities that have come out of the last three years that we've been able to build um, uh, across the world. So I, I think I would just leave this group with, as we go into this panel, um, I think there's two big things that are on our minds. One, you can think about Ginkgo Biosecurity, our laser focus is focusing on building the technologies that you need to enable the global immune system. 
The, this, is, this is not one point technology, it's systems of systems, it's new capabilities that need to be innovated over and over again. And then the second piece is what Jason mentioned right at the beginning. This is not just a public health challenge, this is also a national security challenge, and the, and the unification of national security thinking, public health thinking, with a mindset around how you build technologies into the future for, uh, for to prevent any future events like we just had for the last three years is really kind of where we're thinking. So I'm super excited about this panel for that exact last reason, which is this is a group of people that have been very involved across the national security to public health conversation for many years around biotechnology generally and biosecurity, biodefense specifically. So Megan Frisk, um, who is a senior advisor uh, and biotechnology policy coordinator at the U.S. Department of State, really thinking about what is the leadership the U.S. government has in setting regulatory regimes and in, in leading on what biosecurity should look like. Michelle Rosa, who has recently joined InQtel, uh, the intelligence community's venture arm, but over the last many years has really been one of the key people defining our biotechnology generally and biosecurity policies in the U.S. Uh, and Dr. Richard Hatchett, who in this uh, audience doesn't need much introduction, uh, or in, the, in our community um, doesn't need much introduction. He, is, uh, he leads CEPI, which has done just some amazing work in vaccines across the world. I should mention the other two are also doctors. I apologize for um, we have many doctors. I'm surrounded in this world by doctors. Um, and, and it's, it's amazing. And we have a general. So General Tom Bostick, who is the former chief of the US Army Corps of Engineers, but also a reform biotechnology executive, um, and who has just been an amazing mentor to so many of us at Ginkgo, and is a really amazing uh, human being, will moderate the panel. So thank you so much. Uh, appreciate you all being here. We're excited about what we're building uh, in biosecurity at Ginkgo.